Greetings and welcome to Bloomberg New Economy Conversations. I'm Andy Brown. Big Pharma is redeeming itself. No sector has emerged from the COVID-19 pandemic in a more heroic fashion. Allied with cutting edge biotech companies and buoyed by billions of dollars in government investments, the pharmaceutical industry delivered up a modern scientific miracle at the end of 2020. A slate of remarkably effective vaccines, as well as breakthrough advances in therapies and diagnostics. And it did all this in record time. The victories were built upon years of scientific research, an accelerated approval process that required partnerships across the public and private sectors, and collaboration between rival pharma companies in the manufacturing process. There is every chance that the technologies that have come of age in this effort can be adapted to combat an array of diseases, reshaping the way scientists approach illness. But first, how do we ensure that vaccines developed in the rich world for COVID-19 reach the poorest countries? What's the answer to vaccine nationalism? And what steps should governments and multilateral institutions be taking right now to ensure we're even better prepared and can mount a faster response to the next pandemic? We have an incredible panel of experts that who are going to help us answer those questions. I'm joining you today from Bloomberg headquarters in New York, and I'd like to welcome our global new economy community. We also welcome our viewers tuning in on social media and via the Bloomberg terminal. There will be opportunities throughout this conversation for real-time input from you, our audience. I encourage you to submit questions in the text box in the bottom right of your screen, and I'll invite you to vote in live polling in the top right of your screen. If at any point you encounter technical difficulties, a simple refresh of your browser should help get things back on track. Now let's get right to our first guest. Catalin Carrico, who uh, likes to be uh, go by the name of Katie, is the Senior Vice President at BioNTech. She's also Adjunct Associate Professor at the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania, where she develop, developed a patent together with Drew Weissman uh, to create the revolutionary mRNA vaccines produced by BioNTech Pfizer and Moderna NIH. Welcome to the program, Katie. Thank you. I really should start by thanking you. I've recently received my second shot of the BioNTech Pfizer vaccine that uses the mRNA technology you pioneered. It may literally have saved my life and countless other lives now and in the future. What was the moment when you realized that the technology you'd spent your whole working life developing could actually help to end this pandemic? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, of course, you know, I was very happy to learn that how potent it is, but uh, telling the truth, I expected that because we have already worked uh, uh, long years and uh, in um, animal study, we could see how potent uh, it was protecting with different kind of viruses, of course, not for Corona, but we tested for influenza and um, Zika and we published it and we could show that very similarly formulated uh, nucleoside modified mRNA, how uh, effective it is. It was very surprising, especially that very small amount was uh, effective. And it was very different from previously tried uh, DNA viruses, DNA vaccines where, you know, you had to scale up the amount when they try to use as a vaccine. So I, I, I was very, very happy and yes. So the, the, the COVID mRNA vaccine represents really one of the greatest victories in the history of science. What, what, what's the simplest explanation of how it works? We, we've got a, we actually have a graphic. Maybe you could talk us, talk us through um, uh, the graphic and, and so our, our, our viewers get a sense from the, from the, uh, uh, from the expert on, on, on how, it, how it actually works in the human body. Yes. So, so, so Chinese scientists provided the sequence information and thanks to the technology and many, many people developed the, based on the information gene could be synthesized coding for the critical uh, 
protein which is on the surface of the virus and we have to neutralize this uh, to protect uh, against the virus so that uh, uh, the gene provided template to make messenger RNA. The messenger RNA is present in our body so we this modification we introduce a uh, result that the body will not uh, destroy immediately when it is uh, used as a medicine. So this messenger RNA was put in a, a lipid uh, particle, a little uh, um, uh, to coat it, so make sure that it will uh, not uh, be um, degraded because the RNA degrades very easily by the RNAs. And so this um, is frozen down and then shipped and then injected. Very small amount, uh, 30 microgram is the one thousandth of a piece of a rice. So very small amount of RNA is sufficient. And when it gets to the muscle of the uh, human uh, being, then it will be taken out by immune cells and translating this protein. The RNA uh, is um, in two, three days is already gone. The protein is also short time, just enough to kick in the immune system to generate uh, antibodies and memory cells and T cells. And then this person will, uh, immune system will be ready when any time, even uh, months later, will uh, get an infection. They will be protected. You are famously an indomitable, indomita indominatable spirit. You persevered in your research in the face of widespread skepticism from fellow scientists. You found, found it hard to get your work published. Venture capitals weren't interest, venture capitalists weren't interested in, in investing in you. At one point at the University of Pennsylvania, you were actually demoted. What in the world was going on? And, and where does that grit and determination come from? Uh, maybe it coming is coming from um, you know my humble beginning, because uh, you know my father was a butcher and we I was raised in a very uh, loving but uh, uh, simple family and uh, my parents didn't had a um, higher education but they are very intelligent and encouraged us to study and. Um, Thanks to my great teachers, you know, I could uh, manage to get to the university where I studied and um, did very well. But again, there is, you know, in the small town, I didn't learn English. That's why strong <laughs> accent I have. But um, so at the university, I had to catch up again with the others. And uh, so it was always kind of catching up, but working hard and managed to get a very good um, uh, position in uh, Saged at the uh, Biological Research Center, and uh, then I started to work on RNA there in 1978. And uh, due to limited uh, resources, I had to leave Hungary, although I love to live there, and um, and came to the uh, uni uh, came here to Temple University, where I again studied this uh, small RNA molecule, which was which had an antiviral effect. So it was always a viral field, and tried to develop an antiviral compound. And um, getting to the University of Pennsylvania, um, started to uh, work on messenger RNA to use as a therapeutic uh, molecule, and. Uh, Thanks to my uh, very enthusiastic uh, colleague, uh, Elliot Barnetan, you know, even I couldn't get the money that he supported from his own grant. And I was on the faculty, but because without uh, support, uh, I was demoted, not having any help. Even with Elliot, went out to venture capitalists. We presented the uh, RNA as a technology messenger RNA to use it. but. Maybe we were too early or we were not articulated well enough. And, uh, and again, you know, this was in cardiology, but again, I was, um, after the motion, I was uh, saved by a, a colleague who, uh, David Langer, who was a, a resident at neurosurgery and convinced the chairman that neurosurgery needs a molecular biologist. So this is how I get my first laboratory <laughs> and paid by the department. But again, I had difficulties and um, and luckily I met uh, Drew Weissman and he wanted to develop uh, vaccines. And uh, when I said that I can make RNA, he, uh, you know, we started to work together and it was 19, 98. So 10 years I was already working mRNA with a lot of failure and with the Drew 
you know, we could realize one, we could develop it for a uh, vaccine. And um, we had um, published first time that uh, a very similarly formulated, very similar uh, composition uh, vaccine for uh, against Zika was uh, very uh, effective. And uh, and so this uh, was the first time it was it was published in 1997. Uh, 2017, sorry, 2017. So well, a couple of years before. Your daughter seems to have inherited your determination. Um, we have a picture of her, which I, I'd like to put up. Um, she, she won two Olympics gold medals for the US as a rower. Is it, is it, in, is it in the genes? Uh, you know, I kind of, we were with my husband, we were athletic, but not, not, uh, you know, at that level, but, uh, perseverance and hard work, definitely, uh, maybe, maybe just watching us or maybe genetic. I don't know that <laughs> my parents were working very hard and I also took from them. So few, few people ever imagined a vaccine for COVID could be developed so quickly within, within a matter of a few months. The previous record, I think, was four years for the mumps vaccine. W were you surprised at how quickly it sailed through clinical trials? Yeah, yes, of course, it was uh, seems like uh, very quickly. But uh, I have to tell you that we were already ready with uh, Pfizer together with BioNTech to uh, uh, test to start the human trial with uh, influenza. And so, which is the same composition, only the coding sequence. So the order of the nucleotides were different in, in that case, because it was against the uh, uh, influenza virus. But uh, otherwise, you know, the uh, other part and the composition of the vaccine was the same. And we were ready to start a human trial when it was switched over the coding sequence to the uh, corona spike. What were the critical factors or combination of factors that allowed this astonishingly rapid development? One thing, of course, was massive financial support from governments that essentially de-risked the vaccine development process. Actually, Pfizer did not take that part for, you know, in our uh, considering BioNTech and, uh, and uh, Pfizer, but it was uh, important that uh, taking over the risk, and it was also in Europe, the EU took over the risk and said that they just proceed, and if fail, then, then we will uh, compensate that. But definitely, it is, was critical that the messenger RNA was already uh, ready, and it was developed for decades and, uh, you know, very uh, well advanced in, uh, with, with, with Pfizer and BioNTech. And um, also that uh, uh, the large pharma companies had the ability to scale up quickly. They have all of these uh, experts who would know that how to, how to run quickly a clinical trial, how to uh, scale up uh, the production and the uh, shipping and, and uh, every part, you know, that I was just amazed. I, you know, great respect uh, for all, all the colleagues, all at BioNTech and, and Pfizer that uh, could, uh, could do that. Everybody is such an expert and, and I am just so impressed and all of the credit would, uh, should go to them as well as well as for the competitor company moderna which also used a similar composition uh, vaccine and uh, together with the, the uh, nih you know they could uh, accelerate and uh, perform all of the clinical trial and uh, and succeeded to get the uh, authorization do, do you worry, Katie, about the COVID variants that are emerging now in, in Brazil, South Africa? Is there a risk that they could render the, the current vaccines ineffective? Right now, all of the current uh, variants, the vaccine is still very protective. Uh, UK and uh, Brazil variants is uh, just as uh, good as against the Wuhan type and uh, a little bit less for the uh, South African, but uh, this is just for the antibody response. And you have to know that the messenger RNA also generates a cellular immune response. So meaning that uh, the vaccinated person can eliminate uh, the infected, viral infected cells, not only the freely floating viruses circulating in the blood. So it is a, a second layer of, 
protection is still there. And then for the variants to uh, get around it is very difficult. So I am not get... that worried about. I want to get to an issue, Katie, that I mentioned during the introduction. It's an important one. G given, given the risk that variants pose, should governments be doing more to ensure that the entire world has access to these vaccines now to prevent more variants from emerging? I mean, it's, it's become a commonplace that the pandemic isn't over anywhere until it's over everywhere. Obviously, yes. Uh, so it... Uh... Ideally, we should have a right away everywhere, you know, to make uh, the, this vaccine and uh, many other vaccines, which is uh, developed by other countries, available and help those uh, uh, people to uh, get protected from this deadly virus. And uh, I, I don't uh, know how to to do that, but uh, I am sure there are experts that could figure it out that um, and help. I want to go to our first audience poll to see what our viewers think. What should governments in rich countries do to ensure that COVID-19 vaccines and therapies are available and affordable for the rest of the world? And the options are in this uh, audience poll, first of all, should they implement laws or regulations to force drug companies to waive their patent rights? Should they negotiate with drug companies to buy their intellectual property using taxpayer funds and put it in the public domain? And the third option is nothing. Hope that the public relations pressure forces private companies into voluntarily waiving their IP rights. While we wait for the audience to submit their answers to the poll, let me get your take, Katie. What do you think should be done to expand access to COVID-19 vaccines in the global south? India and South Africa have approached the WTO seeking a waiver on vaccine patent restrictions. What's your perspective on the patent issue? Uh, we have mentioned uh, many times we drew Weissman, we didn't want to patent uh, at all because uh, we were thinking naively that um, we want everybody to use this uh, nucleoside modified mRNA for any kind of therapy, not just for vaccine. And, and this was in 2004. And um, we learned that uh, if we don't license uh, or no patent, then nobody will develop it. So, you know, and for us uh, having the Dorbe Act that uh, saying that if the taxpayers' money were spent uh, on the research, then uh, it should be available freely. Uh, that patent, uh, I. 100% agree with it. You know, I, I, I don't want to um, uh, get rich and then <laughs> and um, I want to help everybody. And I, I understand also that the companies who are developing, they invest a lot of money and, and they, um, you know, they need to collect back. Uh, so I, I don't know that how to how to handle that uh, and how the, you know, what kind of solution would be. But in the case of uh, uh, this vaccine, our goal was at BioNTech and Pfizer to uh, produce as quickly as possible. So because we had most experience with the minus 70 storage, that's why we uh, proceeded with that. And we needed to collect uh, uh, data to show that in minus 20 is also safely can uh, store a certain period of time. I have to mention that minus 70, we have uh, similarly formulated uh, uh, RNA is uh, can be stored for years. So it is also important that, you know, stockpile can be created and, and then shipped uh, as uh, different viruses will uh, occur and then in the future, of course. And um, so, so um, right now, if uh, we would say that everybody can make the BioNTech Pfizer vaccine. The problem is right now that uh, uh, some components has limited availability. There are uh, synthesis issues and other. I had to figure out figure it out. So, so it, this is the reason not for greediness that it is not available for for everybody. So even even if it is available, the technology they couldn't do it. Well, it's pretty clear what our audience thinks about this issue. 57% uh, of them uh, think that government should negotiate with drug companies to buy their intellectual property using taxpayer funds and put it in the public domain. Okay, I'd like to get to our other um, 
two speakers. Um, uh, I'd like to welcome, first of all, uh, Janice Chun. She is the co-founder and CTO of Mammoth Biosciences, a biotechnology company harnessing a revolutionary gene editing tool called CRISPR for rapid and affordable disease detection. Thank you for joining us, Janice. Thank you, Andy. It's really great to be here. I'd also like to welcome Rodrigo Yanez. Uh, um, Rodrigo is Ch uh, it's Chile's Undersecretary of International Economic Relations and has served in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs since March of 2018. Thanks for being here today, Rodrigo. Hello, Andrew. Good morning. So, Janice, I'd like to start with you. You're, you're pushing the frontiers of another of this revolutionary technology platform, CRISPR, which is used to edit DNA. Your goal is to, at Mammoth, is to create CRISPR-based coronavirus diagnostic tests that are as simple as a home pregnancy test, cheap, disposable, fast. Tell us how it works and when you expect it will become widely available. Sure. Yeah. And I think maybe um, to explain how the CRISPR technology works, it also helps to understand its origins. And actually, there are some really beautiful parallels between CRISPR um, and what we're seeing today with the mRNA vaccine and, and how, um, you know, humans have evolved uh, their own immune system to fight against invading pathogens. And we have new ways of, you know, introducing um, vaccines to help them fight against these pathogens, but actually bacteria have also evolved their own defense mechanisms to fight against their own viruses. And so in that way, um, CRISPR is actually like a bacteria's vaccination card where there are little bits of um, you know, virus information that's stored in the bacterial genome that are then used in the future to fight against the same virus that will infect them. So you know, in 2012, Jennifer Doudna, my former PhD advisor, Emmanuel Charpentier and their colleagues were actually able to show that you could take these core components of the CRISPR system, um, engineer them to then target any sequence of interest. And that really opened up this tremendous opportunity to have a programmable gene editing tool that anyone could use to um, edit you know, genetic diseases, for instance. So that has really kicked off this CRISPR revolution and, and this recognition that CRISPR is a really powerful platform technology to develop new medicines. And it was in the last couple of years that we realized that CRISPR isn't just um, you know, a single system. Uh, it's not just you know, the Cas9 protein, which is so well known today for its gene editing capabilities, but actually there's a whole world of CRISPR systems with different features and capabilities that we didn't even really understand until um, we started to look into it. So there's a new protein called Cas12 that we looked at um, a couple of years ago that we recognized had this um, unusual activity that it doesn't just cut the DNA that, that it is programmed to recognize, but also it can provide a real-time signal that actually can detect that DNA sequence. And so that really um, opened our eyes to the possibility that you could use CRISPR as a diagnostic tool. Um, from that discovery, we wanted to really quickly see if we could use it as a proof of concept, as a diagnostic, and worked with um, our collaborators at UCSF to actually show you could detect and diagnose HPV patient samples. And so, of course, when the coronavirus pandemic rolled around last year, we realized we had a tremendous opportunity and responsibility to reconfigure this CRISPR diagnostics platform to go after the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Jennifer Doudna, of course, who you mentioned, won the uh, Nobel Prize for chemistry um, last year. And, and as you say, you, you worked in, in, uh, in her lab. Do you imagine that the diagnostic kit that you're developing will end up as a requirement for air travel, a, a test you'll take on your way through airports, a step you'll take before entry into sports venues or theaters or schools or, or workplace, how, how, how workplaces, how, how, how will it work? Yeah, so our vision from day one has really been to develop CRISPR diagnostics to democratize detection and diagnostics um, at large. And it's sort of, you know, CRISPR really brings in three core components, which is the usability, accessibility, and reliability that you need to have a powerful diagnostic tool. So, you know, as a new technology, we have a lot of um, kind of milestones and proof points to achieve. And I I'm really excited to say that our first um, product that we're 
will be launching very shortly is a high throughput COVID testing workstation that can be used in hospital laboratories to screen through, you know, thousands of samples in a single work shift with very minimal um, FTE requirements. And so what we're excited about this technology is the ability to, like you said, place into areas like schools, workplaces where, um, you know, people need to know very quickly if there's potentially someone who's infected in a certain environment. So you can imagine that um, this type of technology will be used very widely to help, um, you know, screening uh, as we get out of the pandemic as well. I mean, it's absolutely critical in, in reopening the global economy, right? And getting travel going again. I mean, at, perhaps as important as the vaccine itself, given the problems that we've heard with, with, with rolling out a, um, you know, a, a, a global vaccine passport. Exactly. I think part of, you know, all of these um, different solutions have to work together, right? In order to, you know, understand how this virus is changing, we have to be able to track it, we have to be able to detect it. And that, and that requires being able to roll out diagnostics very widely so that uh, we can be prepared. So I think all of these um, different solutions, you know, we have to work together to, to get out of it. So in, in building this diagnostic kit, you, you've taken a very collaborative approach. Have I got that right? I mean, U.S. and Chinese scientists have been working together, not against each other on this project. And you've sort of set to one side the issue of, of patents for the greater good of rolling out the diagnostic tests. I mean, that's interesting because as, as we've just been discussing, vaccine development is is almost the opposite. Vaccine makers are competing for market share, competing for profits. How do you explain that difference in approach? Well, I would say certainly, you know, the CRISPR patent landscape is very complex and there have been a number of pretty high profile battles that, um, you know, people have heard about through, through the press um, with respect to the CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing technology. I would say that um, for the COVID-19 pandemic, the goal was for all uh, developers of CRISPR diagnostics to say, okay, can we actually take this new technology and put it out into the world as quickly as possible because we are facing an emergency crisis. And so questions around patents were essentially put aside. And for us at Mammoth, um, one of the things that we did very early on in the pandemic was put together a white paper with all of the details um, for actually deploying a CRISPR-based diagnostic. So our goal was here are, you know, the sequences and the um, chemistries required to actually uh, enable anyone to, to take this protocol and, you know, let it get it started in their own laboratories. And we're really excited to see actually a number of companies leverage our uh, sequences and our protocols, as well as other academic groups using this information that we put out widely um, to, to enable their own programs and to accelerate their own testing programs as well. So, um, you know, certainly we've seen our colleagues around the globe do the same thing. And I think that's been one really remarkable outcome of this pandemic is that there's been this shared vision to do something good. And um, I'm really inspired by the way that, um, you know, people have come together, you know, ju not just, um, you know, within companies, but really private public partnership um, to, to push new technologies forward. And I think, you know, what we've seen over the last year really proves that um, collaborations are a way to really accelerate uh, discoveries and translations of those discoveries uh, into something very meaningful. Right, because, I mean, the argument you often hear from big pharma companies for patent exclusivity is that it incentivizes innovation. I mean, so what incentivizes you? What, 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 gets, what, gets, what gets you, your team, uh, you're, you know, up in the morning to to develop this th these technologies. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, very similar to what to what Katie said that the goal is to help as many people as possible, and I think that there are just very few opportunities that you have um, in this world to create something with such tremendous impact. And I think that's what keeps us going is understanding that there's a huge unmet need and we have the potential to fill that. So certainly, you know, the the patent issue is very complex, and there's certainly many really good arguments on both sides. But at the end of the day, I think for us as test developers, as scientists, as people who really just are so passionate about developing these technologies, it's really about taking that to the next step and um, being able to, to, to do good. Rodrigo, before we get to the situation in Chile, how would you answer our audience question about 
patents? How should governments get these vaccines and therapies um, into, in, in, into poorer countries? Should they be putting more pressure on the pharma companies? Well, maybe not, but I think the answer goes on goes better in the in, in, in a way that both the pharma sector and the governments uh, sit on the same tables and, and talk. And that is why what we are encouraging in the past few days, also with other countries like New Zealand, Australia, in a, in a joint statement in the context of the WTO. We had yesterday a meeting with the new DG there, and uh, the idea is that we get uh, pharmaceutical companies and governments to sit and, and discuss this issue, increasing production and making it flow uh, faster uh, to, to, to the developing world. It's playing out on the ground in Chile. I mean, you, you don't seem to have had any difficulties at all securing vaccines. In fact, uh, Chile is on track to become one of the first countries in the world to achieve herd immunity. I mean, you're, you're right up there with, with, with Israel. Yes, we did that with a very pragmatic approach. Uh, I would say it's a three-way strategy, which uh, in, encompassed a phase three clinical trials in Chile with the very close participation of the local scientific uh, community. Uh, also, we went for an uh, advanced purchase agreement, like the one that we had with uh, Pfizer and BioNTech, which are not running uh, phase three clinical trials in Chile. And third, our participation in COVAX. So from the very beginning, we, we somehow envisioned that uh, there would be shortages, that this could maybe turn into uh, some nationalistic uh, sort of discussion um, and that export restrictions were uh, also uh, uh, something to be, to be faced. So we did not leave any vaccine out of, of, of uh, the scenario. The only thing that mattered for us was that this was effective and safe. We, we actually have a chart that shows just how well the rollout has gone in, in, in Chile. Um, as you say, you locked in supply contracts very early in the pandemic with just about every vaccine maker from the US, Europe, China, Russia. Um, uh, how did you get so far ahead of the game? Some, some say having a billionaire president, uh, President Piñera, uh, was 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 your secret weapon? Well, his style is uh, pretty hands-on, uh, and and therefore his involvement in this, uh, to me as the lead negotiator of this, was was a very powerful tool to trigger. Um, but this was also a very, uh, I would say, broader uh, job, and that is somewhat the, the secret. I think we we were able to put up a, a very uh, fast decision-making process for decisions as complex and uh, as, as this one, right? From a scientific perspective, economic, and, and others. So we we had a decision-making process that made us uh, possible to secure batches as soon as we identify them. And also, it's no secret that one of our main bets was also uh, an agreement with Sinovac from China which uh, as a background has uh, also uh, uh, an alliance with our top university, which is the, one of the leading universities in Latin America too, uh, which let us know the vaccine uh, way before uh, uh, the moment we signed for the advanced purchase agreement. So the, 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 the goal was to secure uh, our uh, vaccines for our high risk population, which is nearly over 5 million. That goal was achieved a week ago. Now we are uh, approaching 6 million people with at least their first dose and half of it uh, already has their second dose. 10% of that number uh, is with Pfizer-BioNTech jabs and the rest of the 90% is with uh, the Sinovac vaccine. That will change over time. Second quarter, we expect a, a, a more heavy presence of the Pfizer-BioNTech jab and also new players such as AstraZeneca and uh, other vaccines such as CanSino, and also we are in advanced negotiations with Sputnik V. So, so, so how's that worked out? I mean, let's face it, Sin Sinovac vaccine from China isn't quite as good as, as the uh, BioNTech, as the mRNA vaccines. Um, do people get to choose or do they take what they're given? 
No, you, you take uh, what you're given. In my case, I got the Sinovac job um, and uh, it it's true that in terms of the symptomatic disease, the Pfizer-BioNTech job is more e e efficient. But uh, what we look for here is people uh, to uh, not end up hospitalized or in an ICU unit on, on, and die. And the vaccine has proven to be highly, highly effective in that. We even have a, a, a case here, uh, which is not, you know, representative in terms of statistics, but we had an elderly home uh, uh, where we had an outbreak where 51 people over 75 years with comorbidities got uh, the infected uh, only with the first dose of the Sinovac vaccine. Uh, all of them, only all of them uh, got uh, a moderate disease and uh, only two of them uh, needed uh, intermediate hospitalization. One of them unfortunately died and it was the only person that decided not to take the vaccine. So that gives us hope that for the purpose of what we look to avoid, uh, this vaccine is highly uh, effective. So you're not getting public pushback against what you might look at as potentially possibly a sort of a second rate kind of vaccine? No, not really. It was like that before we started the campaign. But uh, people realized that it was it had a it had a, a, an extremely good safety uh, profile, and that it's starting to prove very effective. And also the involvement of an in independent external player such as our top uh, university uh, also helped uh, uh, get people trusting the vaccines in process overall. Or today, only ten percent of Chileans would not get the jab, and that fell and dropped from nearly 40 percent a few a few months ago. So unlike many of uh, of, of its neighbors in, in South America, Chile has a well-developed primary health system of, of, of clinics, even in the most remote parts of the country, plus a history of rolling out immunization programs that goes goes back a, a, a century. How, how did how did Chile become such a model country in, in, in terms of, of public health? Well, rolling out vaccines in particular has a 40-year uh, uh, story here and tradition. Um, in, in this particular case, also, we have a, I would, what I would say yearly training, which is our influenza vaccine, which uh, half of our population gets every year. That's nearly 8 million people, and that has allowed us to, to have a very efficient system that involves also city councils and, and local at the local level uh, health authorities. So even, you know, we, we, at, we can get in past uh, campaigns up to 800,000 uh, 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 vaccines or shots a day. And, uh, and that has, is what has allowed us to be at the forefront of uh, the rollout of the vaccine. Uh, but Chile has a long-standing tradition in, in its public health. Um, we have over 1,600 different points of inoculation. 26 different distributions in a 4,000 kilometer long country, right? So um, it's a, it's a, a mix of, of that. And also in, in facing the pandemic, we have also a very strong private health uh, system, but the health authority uh, made a decision that uh, both public and private uh, systems were a single one to face this pandemic. This has uh, also a better efficiency in distributing the the ICU beds uh, and beds more generally for the pandemic, but also in distributing the vaccine. So Chile didn't do so well when it came to controlling the spread of the vaccine, but as, as we've just heard, um, it's done amazingly well to deliver the vaccine. So how do you explain this discrepancy given, um, you know, it, it was the, the same public health system that was sort of responsible for, for both aspects of the program? Well, I'd say we have done an average job. Uh, if, you, if you look at excess rates, um, Chile comes only in Latin American region after Costa Rica. Um, and, and we are at levels uh, similar to Europe. Um, the second thing is that uh, our numbers, I think, have a, a better quality. Uh, by far, Chile leads in PCR testing in the Latin American region. We perform nearly 70,000 a day now. 
and and half of our population has uh, 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 gotten uh, already a, a PCR test. So, um, of course, numbers might be higher, but we are in terms of OECD countries uh, at the average. And if you look at excess rates, uh, we are at levels similar to Europe. Um, we have not made, a, I mean, we have a, what we call the dynamic a quarantine uh, um, um, system or approach. So, uh, and at this point, uh, I think uh, also quarantines are extremely um, difficult for our people. Uh, they increase poverty. They have made us lose uh, what we have advanced in the, in the past few years. And we try to avoid them, certainly, because they are painful for people. Um, but uh, also that goes along with the 19 billion US dollar package to support, you know, uh, the middle class and, and, and lower income uh, people. So, but we are standing also firm, waiting for uh, and, and hanging tight for the herd immunity to come. And hopefully that will be by mid of this year. Indeed. So I want to go to our first audience question. This is from David Klaus, uh, and David is an affiliate at the Stanford Center for International Security and Cooperation in Bethesda, Maryland. Uh, David asks, would this have happened, um, uh, the vaccine development, I guess, without the significant involvement of the U.S. government? What could government have done better? What did it do differently that helped uh, uh, the uh, initiative succeed? Uh, Katie, do you want do you want to do you want to take that one? Uh, the, the the role of the U.S. government here and how it could have done better. I I I am not sure that I am expert on to answer this question, but um, so definitely definitely the uh, decision to um, help and bring together all of the players and make sure that um, they will proceed. Because at the beginning, nobody knew, except me, I knew that the RNA vaccine will work very well, but of course, you know, not knowing that which vaccine will be the most successful. So the government um, uh, effort to put, put, uh, invite all, everybody together and then uh, provide support for all of them, whether it, they develop the protein base or whether or uh, um, viral-based uh, 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 vaccine, so they, they provided help for each of them, and uh, so that was very important, so the, that gave us coordination, so it was critical. I don't know what could have been done better. Of course, it is difficult to, to give uh, uh, information out, and of course, uh, people say, oh, now that uh, we have to have a mask, no mask, but... but uh, People had to understand that uh, as the situation evolves, uh, people and, and the opinion about what is helpful or not is also changing. And so, not saying that you know they are talking different things. So, so the information maybe that was also sufficient, which came out. It is just uh, you know the people like to blame somebody for something and. And were not, and of course, everybody was frustrated with the lockdown. But um, for uh, I, I don't know that what could have been done better. But definitely, full, uh, inviting everybody and then helping uh, all of the players, it was important. Janice, what, what's been the role of, of government in the development of, of um, your diagnostics and indeed in the CRISPR area generally? Yeah, yeah. In the same way, um, the government has really stepped up in terms of providing um, investment into development of diagnostic technologies and helping them scale and bring bring new technologies to market. So, in our case, we've been fortunate to have the support of the NIH Radix initiative, which was part of the uh, you know 1.5 uh, billion dollar stimulus package for investment in in diagnostics. And, um, you know, through that program, we've had the benefit, like Katie said, of connecting with um, many experts within the entire uh, process of, um, you know, uh, you know, concept all the way through commercialization. And for a new technology like CRISPR that is um, just, you know, we're only scratching the surface of what's possible, the, the Radex team and NIH um, has really, you know, made a significant investment in helping take this new technology to market. So I think that um, these types of partnerships are extremely valuable and they can certainly accelerate that whole process. And that's something that we've 
um, seen you know, throughout this, this um, last year. Uh, and um, I, I hope that this type of urgency and, and acceleration and focus um, will well, carry I mean, on the pandemic. I wanted to ask you, I mean, is, is this a sort of a, a one-off um, collaboration, um, you know, which, which, which has been accelerated um, and initiated because of this this massive threat to the to the global economy uh, posed by COVID, or, or or is it a model that you think that that will continue after we've got COVID under control? I do hope it's a model that will continue because you know certainly a lot of the investment in helping these companies have been part of building a, a broader platform. Where, for instance, you know with the mRNA vaccine, the hope is that you would you know be able to really re reconfigure that to attack any other uh, emerging virus. And in, in, the, in the case of CRISPR, again, it's a programmable system where you could ideally, you know, simply replace the guide RNA molecule to target another, um, in, you know, foreign pathogen. So in that way, you know, we've set a foundation, I would say, as far as proving what can be done in a, in a short amount of time uh, and done effectively. So I think that this is a model that we'll continue to look back to and say, well, what are the things that worked? What are the things that we can improve and, and, and be able to take that in the future? Rod Rodrigo, what's the situation in, in Chile? I mean, has the government stepped in? Has it taken a, a greater role in, in, in medicine and in, in, in health care? How has the government responded to this? Well, in terms of this pandemic, uh, from this ministry also, certainly we, we think there should be a, a, a more concerted effort. And, and I, I, I said that in the beginning, but uh, we think that uh, scaling up the production of the vaccine is central and we, we, we advocate for the WTO to be the place where this uh, should be discussed. And, and in this initiative that I mentioned, what we asked the director general is to sit with companies and identify right uh, uh, the issues that could solve these issues uh, this, uh, in terms of under uh, of, of capacity underutilized, etc. And also identify uh, also any kind of uh, um, trade barriers uh, for for vaccines, and uh, not just for vaccines, but also for for uh, um, you know first um, um, sort of aid uh, supplies. Um, and and from a local perspective, here the the government, what I said is um, also to to react this uh, as a national united system both private and public so uh, when you when we think in emergency beds for instance icu units we have a national capacity so when a city for instance is near to collapse or or, or has filled the capacity we transport that people uh, by plane to to another city and that has uh, let us react it better and uh, and and to avoid the last bed you know dilemma um, and uh, certainly in the future, uh, we will have to try to see how, you know, we could be more resilient doing stockpiling, but also trying to identify regional uh, value chains in the region. Um, and, and but the discussion that I think should uh, have at its focus and, and the new DG is also very important because she used to be the head of the Gavi Foundation. Um, because it has to do a lot with trade and it has to do a lot with seating with stakeholders and private and pharmaceutical companies. So that's what we are uh, 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 advocating, uh, Andrew. Okay, thanks. Um, I'd like to bring in another audience question. This one is from Jose Kfouri, who is the CEO of Marabini uh, Graos Brazil, based in Sao Paulo. He asks, how will international borders and vaccine passports work? Um, uh, maybe we could start with 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 with, with Janice. I mean, what's your what's your prediction? Are we going to get vaccine passports, or are they really unworkable? Yeah, I think that's a, a really good question. I think there's a lot of debate on both sides around. Well, okay, how we want to protect the greatest number of people at the same time. You can imagine that this type of um, uh, it, this this type of passport could lead to um, sort of, I think, some level of discrimination as well. So um, I, I certainly am not an expert to really dive into the complexities of this issue. But I think that um, the goal right now is to get as many people vaccinated as possible. And I know that there are certainly um, questions on whether, you know, employees can even ask or force their employees to get vaccinated, right? There's, there's a lot of um, 
kind of legal challenges as well as far as what um, what what can be required. So I think that um, while we're still working around the issue of equitable distribution of the vaccine, it's hard to start implementing policies uh, when we know that there are people who are still, uh, you know, struggling to get even that first shot. Right. Well, as you say, it is complicated. As an example, China insists that to get into China, you're supposed to have the Chinese vaccine, uh, uh, Sinovac, and yet in the United States, you can't get that vaccine. Um, uh, AstraZeneca has not been approved yet in the United States. So, Rodrigo, should there be, do you think, a more centralized global system that sets common standards, recognizing vaccines at, at, a, you know, at, at, at an international level? Is that achievable? Well, we all have been in this past, you know, few years talking about the crisis of multilateralism. And I think there is an opportunity here to be to, to lead by example. And we think that the WHO is, is, is a place where we can have this discussion, that vaccines that are recognized by the WHO are eligible for these uh, passport ideas, that we do not uh, restrict them to the vaccines recognized only by the national regulators of, of the issuing uh, parties. And, um, and we are following that discussion. There are initiatives in the OECD uh, right now uh, at the WHO. We are looking with very close eye what, what this green passport of the EU and Israel and others. But I think the response will have to, to, to be multilateral and, and, and to be consistent uh, about it. So hopefully, we will all converge into something that recognizes vaccines that are WHO backed. Finally, let's talk about future applications for all of the technologies and learnings that have come out of this, this pandemic. Katie, what comes next for you and your mRNA research? Do you pick up cancer research again? I, I believe that that's where the, some of the uh, initial focus was. Um, do you start looking at diseases like malaria, like HIV? What comes next for mRNA? We already heard uh, today from the Wall Street Journal that uh, actually Pfizer decided that uh, we'll go for the other uh, infectious diseases, so develop vaccine. And that is very good. We already know from the messenger RNA therapy meetings that uh, many other antiviral uh, vaccine is developed, and uh, not just for against viruses, but uh, even for uh, malaria. The, uh, and um, so uh, that is one one field. So that uh, more vaccine will be developed and. Um, there are also efforts uh, using the Cas9 and the other Cas system to uh, and the special delivery of the messenger RNA to bone marrow to help uh, those who are suffering sickle cell anemia or maybe HIV to change uh, uh, introduce some genetic uh, um, alteration to bone marrow to make sure that those people will uh, not suffer uh, anymore. And so that is a, also a plan for several companies. It needs um, very much to uh, develop a formulation that will be targeted special organs or special cell types. So, um, of course, the cancer vaccine project was um, always in the forefront in all of the messenger RNA companies. But, um, you know, there is also a big challenge because there are so many different type of uh, uh, cancer existence and, and identifying the right target is, is a big challenge. So, uh, you know, in the uh, coronavirus, it was obvious that it is the spike protein and um, but for the cancer, it, um, you know, identifying the driver mutation and generating a response against that. So it is uh, still a lot of science has to be done before that. And uh, there are many other uh, applications, you know, in uh, which is already in the clinic uh, with a uh, heart disease already phase two in injecting uh, into mRNA into the heart and uh, uh, treating uh, wounds and many other things, which of course not for this uh, global problem, but uh, definitely the cell anemia you know, uh, vaccine against other viruses, against malaria is uh, very important for many, many 
Yeah, we, we have a question uh, uh, again on that topic from Tamara Norris, a senior advisor at Ontario Power in Toronto. And um, uh, Tamara asks, how are mRNA and, uh, or CRISPR useful in potential uh, cancer treatments? Maybe, maybe Janice, you could you could talk to the uh, speak to the, the, the CRISPR uh, technology. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think CRISPR has shown to be a really exquisite tool for precision editing. And for a lot of cancers, these are um, genetic diseases that we may understand the, um, the biomarkers that are involved in the progression of disease. So once you can understand um, that target that is needed to, to be edited, um, CRISPR really plays a critical role in helping design genetic medicines that can specifically go after that target sequence and hope to repair that faulty gene. So in that way, as a gene editing tool, um, you know, the flexibility of, of the CRISPR system is really, really powerful in, in helping um, treat those types of diseases. Of course, on the diagnostic side, the same thing, right? Whether it's seek and edit or seek and detect, um, CRISPR can be reprogrammed to go very specifically after these sequences. And I think in general, we're seeing healthcare shifting away from a one size fits all model to something more along the lines of precision medicine. And I think we're going to need you know, more sophistication in our tools, whether that's in the diagnostics, vaccines and therapeutics to really go after um, you know, very specifically uh, individual profiles to help us uh, manage and treat diseases. Is there a risk that these new, fancy, high-tech, very expensive uh, vaccines and therapies could end up getting hogged by rich countries, uh, as is happening now with, with, you know, with the mRNA vaccines, and that this could actually widen global disparities measured in, in you know, uh, 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 lifespans? Uh, Katie, is, is, that a, is that a worry? Uh, expensive, expensive therapies, CRISPR, mRNA that simply won't be affordable uh, in poor countries and that could exacerbate global disparities, inequalities. No, I don't think so. And then I might mention that uh, messenger RNA is actually used for the uh, coding for those uh, editing enzymes. And so the two technology is actually combined. And then the main target is uh, used for, uh, as I mentioned, sickle cell anemia, or vaccines against malaria, and those are all... Well, we have seen some of it now. I mean, it's not... It's, uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, go, go ahead, Rodrigo. Yes, yeah, sorry. No, I'm sorry, I have a delay, so I can't... Go, go, uh, go ahead, we can, we, go can, ahead. We, can hear, we can hear you. Okay, no, no, I was saying that that was happening uh, already at some point. Uh, it's no surprise that many of the vaccines, um, you know, have been distributed first to developed countries or the one that has in, had invested them uh, first. Uh, we, we, we were lucky to secure a deal with Pfizer-BioNTech, um, but we had to resource to, 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 to this other, uh, you know, multi-platform, multi-developer vaccine. If not, we would not be in this position today, as, as simple as that. And that is why uh, we need to have this discussion when thinking uh, in the future, because uh, it's not sustainable. Uh, and, and definitely, if, if we are talking about making uh, our countries uh, secure by, by years uh, from now and, and having the developing world uh, getting so lagged behind in the, in the, in the queue, um, we will not solve this, and um, and and there is a risk of 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 this to happen. But this must be a a, a multiplayer, I would say, dialogue, uh, not from a top-down perspective, but rather a, a, a multilateral approach with the private sector on the table. Janice, what's your view? Yeah, I think that um, it's not just the vaccine. I think we've seen that in general with um, the the widening gap of socioeconomics that has played out last year where we have tremendous winners and also just people who have really struggled to get through. So um, certainly there is a risk and a worry that um, without equitable distribution, you're gonna potentially see that gap widen. And I think there has to be really a proactive effort to help close that. And, and that goes well beyond the vaccine, but really so many parts of our economy as well. We're going to have to leave it there. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. Uh, Janice Chan, uh, Katie Carrico, uh, Rodrigo Yanez, 
thank you again for, for joining us. We're grateful for your participation and for your perspectives. Uh, and to our audience, both within and beyond the Bloomberg New Economy community, thanks for joining us. You can follow the conversation with at New Econ Forum on Twitter or like us on Facebook. Join us next month for our conversation on the ascent of digital money. That's right here on Tuesday, April the 20th. Until then, stay well.